I'm hoping to make a, a little bit of history here today. Uh, there's a, a, a technical social movement that's growing on the issue of uh, massively intelligent machines. Personally, I believe this, this issue will dominate our global politics this century. And uh, it's only this year that it's starting to go mainstream. For example, in January of this year, uh, History Channel had me uh, 10 minutes on a program. If you like watching Discovery Channel, keep an eye out in uh, next month, um, November, I think. Uh, there'll be a 45-minute documentary specifically on this theme, although in America the issue tends to be called Singularity, and that'll be the title of the talk of the, of the program. And uh, I'm hoping with the, the answers that you give to this questionnaire, I will then use those answers, put them in a press release, and distribute it to literally a dozen countries. Right? So you're the first group. So if this thing really flies, you'll, you'll be making a bit of history. So uh, please uh, you know, stew over the question, uh, over lunch, and then at the, at the beginning of the next, or well, the first session of the afternoon, please give them back to me. I'll you know, you look around and you know, the guy in this shirt, right? And then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll analyze them this evening, and if there are some interesting replies, I mean, if you, if you reply the way I quasi expect you to, then uh, I, I will then hit the media with, 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 with those statistics. So hopefully interesting. Okay, so um, there are, a lot of these ideas will be new to you. But, uh, firstly, this term arcing, what does that mean? Well, I'm retired, and I've been asking around people. In, I've been living five years in China, so I'm a bit out of touch with the late, latest social thinking in the US. Uh, the previous five years I was in the US, in fact, quite locally in Logan, Utah. It's at the university there. So what do you call a person who retires? Because you know, I'm a boomer, 64, probably look about 50. But, you know, I'm a boomer. And there's millions of us now retiring, and we're living off our savings, and we're saying, well, we're not going to crawl off in a corner and just die, you know, wait to die, because they've got 20, 30 more years of life left, right? So uh, I wanted a, a label to, for, for these people, and so I, I just had to invent one, because I didn't know of a label. So if you, if you do know one, please tell me. So I, I just say, I'm arcing. That's after retirement careering. <laughs> right? I, I, just, I just have a new career. I don't get paid. You know, by definition, I'm retired, okay? But I'm living off my savings. I'm living in China, so everything's like you know, seven times cheaper, so a major advantage. <coughs> so I've gone back to my old love, and, and this, is what I'm, this is what I'm doing now. Uh, okay. All right? Um, I'm going to talk about two, two new ideologies that are growing. And there, there are, you know, movements, thousands at least, of people in both movements. I'm interested in both. What they have in common is both of them are consequences of accelerating technologies. Right? So, for example, the internet speed is doubling every year, and that's going to have a huge impact in the future on the, on the rise of this ideology, or this philosophy of globism, of creating a world state, you know, a fully democratic global world state. And this other one, far more ominous, is uh, the prospect of massively intelligent machines because the technologies are going to make that possible. OK, so globism. So it's a two-part talk, in a sense. And in, in the middle of this talk, there will be a five-minute, four or five-minute uh, television clip from the ABC that's Australia's Broadcasting Commission, so you need to adapt to the accent somewhat. Are, are you hearing Brit or Aussie accent from when I speak. See, I've lived in seven countries, and three of them were English-speaking. Like, when, when I was a professor in America, I'd say something, and sometimes my class would go, huh? <laughs> and I'm saying, hmm, was that Brit or Aussie? OK. So now the big dream, of course, is if you have a global state, hopefully no more wars, uh, no more arms trade. You know, almost $2 trillion a year we waste on arms a year. And have a guess who's the biggest offender? the arms manufacturer and trader, US, then Europe, then Russia, as far as I know. Okay? So we can get rid of the arms trade, which in moral terms is worse than the slave trade. At least it was in the interest of the slaver to keep the slaves alive, right? 
There's no money in a dead slave. But the arms trade is all about killing people. And uh, with the internet satellites with extremely high bandwidths, you could beam down all the world's knowledge. You, you could tell the, the third world peasant, and I live in China, so I'm just highly conscious of this. Western China, they're so poor. Oh my God, they're under $2 a day. So you could, you could tell them, uh, you want to pull yourself out of poverty? Fine, here's the means, educate yourself and get rich. Right? So no more poverty. <clears throat> Now, there are lots of factors pushing towards this, this, uh, this philosophy, this, this, this ideology. And in my view, the most powerful one is the fact that the internet is speeding up all the time. Now, if you think today's internet's fast, that's nothing in comparison to what's coming. So uh, I've, I've labeled this, this fact that the internet doubles its speed every, every year, every 12 months. So I, so I call it this phenomenon BRAD, bit rate annual doubling. So uh, now I'm a physicist, mathematical physicist. To me, there's really no limit to how tiny something can get that you put information onto. You, you get down, 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 down. So this, this doubling effect will probably continue for decades, in which case in 30 years, that's 2 to power 30, that's a billion times faster than today. And if you go up 40 years, you know, you're getting up to like a trillion times faster. Huh? What, what could you do with an internet that was a billion or a trillion times faster than today's? Well, you could have vivid, you know, as real as real, vivid three-dimensional imagery, as vivid as I see you right now, right? From all over the planet. Everyone gets everything. Everyone gets all the world's media. So our mentalities will shift up from national to, obviously, Global, right? We'll just think globally. And I'll just, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a whole philosophy. It's, it's difficult to give it to you in like 10, 15 minutes. But, but you know, there are a bunch of factors pushing towards uh, the creation of a global state. The size of political units. Today, we're moving up to the union. European Union, South American Union, Asia, African Union, the Japanese are pushing very hard now for a Jap uh, an Asian Union and so on. So the next step after that would be when the unions unionize, <laughs> the unions block, the blocks block, and then you'll get a unit the size of the, of the, of the planet. Uh, tourism. You think there are a lot of Chinese tourists in America today? You wait another decade. Chinese government is saying within 10 years there'll be 10, sorry, 100 million Chinese traveling every year. And I'm predicting race riots in, in Australia, Melbourne, within 10 years because you go downtown and every, of four people, three will be Chinese tourists, right? When you do the numbers, the back of the envelope type calculations. So massive tourism, economic growth, of course. As you get richer, you can afford to travel. High speed trains. Uh, Chinese now have more high-speed track than the rest of the world. Right? So they'll you know, put a network all over the country and then internationally links right through to Europe and so on. So we'll have these four to 500 kilometer an hour high-speed trains everywhere. Okay, so that, that will cause mobility to shoot up. Inter internet speed keeps doubling. So we'll, you know, we'll get the world's media, everyone will get everything. It'll lead to you know, great pressures for a global language. And once uh, everyone can speak the same language, then you'll get, inevitably, I think, cultural homogenization. And if we get that, that will solve a lot of problems. And this, these, these enable the, the growth of a global state. <laughs> uh, you know, nearly every country is in some kind of block, you know, a, a multinational block. We live in a global economy. We have an international criminal court in The Hague and in Holland and Europe. International law is growing, satellite television, you know, countries beaming down their national news programs, you know, BBC World, uh, in, uh, I, uh, CNN International, France 24, uh, Deutsche Welle, NHK World, Japan, what, whatever. So, you know, getting more and more uh, international in, in our news. Uh, English is by far and away the most spoken first or second language. You know, far and away, so uh, we'll get a kind of 
linguistic snowball effect. Now, little kids will be zapping international news programs and they'll notice, oh, 60% is in English. Daddy, I better learn English. And then if you're a minister of telecommunications, you're sending up your country's programs to the world. Uh, you'll send up, of course, your own country's language, plus maybe a few others, of course, English. Right? So you get a snowball effect. So English will become a world language. And that'll, that'll have a... So th as a global language, that'll help the global media. We'll have global universities. They're starting up today. Uh, you can, uh, I think the British Open University has something like hundreds of thousands of students. Right? So you, you can just do all your coursework online. Uh, you know, this, this, I see, is a major prerequisite for, 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 Glo for Globa, creating a global mentality. Okay, so we have, what, United Nations, 193, I think, registered countries. So there are roughly about 200 countries in the world. So we, we live, today's global politics is based on a system of sovereign nation states, right? And effectively, what are they all doing? They're all preparing for the next war, right? Spending nearly $2 trillion a year on arms. What an incredible waste, okay? So, uh, in the 50s, 60s, I can remember when I was, you know, I'm old, so when I was 15 years old, I can remember seeing the tears, I get quite emotional about this, in my high school teachers in 1962, what happened in 62, seen the movie 13 Days, we were that close to nuclear war, right, so the one teacher saying to the other, uh, is this the last day? It was like hours before Khrushchev finally made the decision to pull back the, the missiles from Cuba, from the Cuban Missile Crisis. So uh, in, in our current sovereign nation state system, fear is a major factor. So fear of nuclear war, you know, another war, you know, there's a huge amount of money wasted every year, and we're not really tackling our major problems like climate change and, and so forth. So we really, we really need a world government for, for these kinds of reasons. We want, we want to get rid of war, what a, what a waste. Uh, you know, the environment type problems. Um, you know, our financial system is, is a mess, right? It's just a mess. And uh, let's, let's just get rid of poverty. Like, uh, well, I'll give you a quick example. Uh, you're walking in a park and you see a little toddler falls into the lake. What's your impulse? Well, you'd argue, well, I've just bought myself some expensive new sports shoes, so I'm not going to get them all dirty. I'm not going to save the toddler. Now, most people would think you're a monster. But if you think about it, by buying the sports shoes, some toddler in some poor third world country is going to die that day of starvation because you didn't spend the money to, to buy them one meal. You know, you bought some sports shoes, right, in, in a sense. That's, that's a famous argument by Peter Singer, uh, one of the top um, applied philosophers in, on the planet. Okay, so let's get rid of poverty, world poverty. So if we do have a global state, a fully democratic, you know, with a total accountability on planet-wide, worldwide, uh, we can get rid of war, we can get rid of the arms trade, we can educate everybody, make everyone wealthy. You know, if everyone's educated to the limit of their ability, you know, then most people get wealthy and hence greater happiness. If, if you're starving, you're not happy. <clears throat> now, of course, uh, why do we not live in a global state? Well, there are lots of problems, right? A lot of people just think the whole notion is nuts, right? Global lonely, just is that an American word, baloney? Just, just you know, basically BS, right? Okay. Uh, you know, the nationalists won't like it at all. Uh, the politicians, they like having their, you know, their, their national sovereignty. Uh, particularly noticed in America, uh, the, yeah, quite a difference between the US and uh, um, Europe on this. Uh, a lot of people think if there's going to be a global state, that offers an opportunity for a global dictatorship, right? So, Huge cultural differences, oh my God. Uh, the difference, say, between Arabs and Americans or whatever, okay? Uh, clash of ideologies, communism, capitalism, whatever. Huge religious differences, uh, you know, the charity begins at home. Like, uh, we Arabs, it's our oil, right? It's under our soil, it doesn't belong to the world. That, that kind of thinking. Uh, cultural inertia, you know, 
it takes a lot of effort to get people to, to change their basic values. Uh, cultural alienation, you, you, you travel, go somewhere else, and uh, the people are very strange, and you, you feel alienated. They're not, they're not home, in a sense. And the, a, a clash between the multicultured and the monocultured. These people, like a multi is to a mono, monocultured person. Sort of like the way a city slicker is to a country bumpkin. Right? The, the multis are just so much more sophisticated. So you, this, you know. How to get there? Well, lots of possibilities, lots of... Uh, one is, um, you know, let's have the big meeting and just write out a constitution for the whole planet. Uh, this, this is the one I prefer. Um, the U European Union today, 27 countries in a few months, 28. And there's like a few more in the pipeline than 35. That's a sixth of the whole, whole planet. Uh, you got people talking about uh, uh, Sarkozy, French president, talking about a Mediterranean Union. Uh, Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany, trying to persuade Washington to form a Atlantic Union, so NAFTA, EU, to rival the the giants of China and India, who are members of the Billion Club. You know, this kind of stuff. Uh, a lot of other people want to reform the United Nations. That, that would be then the stepping stone towards GLOBA. That's the name I give the global state. Uh, as this ideology becomes more popular, uh, uh, bottom-up grassroots pressure may, may help it uh, come in. Uh, we're, we're in a dem democratizing world. Every, t every year, roughly, on average, about two countries democratize. Uh, the Arabs are going through that process right now. The Chinese government is paranoid that the same thing may happen to China. I predict in about a decade, China will democratize for the same reasons as all the others. Uh, step by step, uh, you know, how, how long will it take? Well, my guesstimate is somewhere between 40, 50 years from now. But again, just a guess. Uh, now, I won't spend a lot of... If GLOBA is created, then obviously a whole bunch of institutions will need to be created. And they're basically analogs of what already exists at national level or, or union level, right? So, you know, constitution, president, parliament, blah, 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 blah. So, I need to watch the time. So, if GLOBA comes into existence, what, what, would, what were its tasks? What would it need to be? Well, first, it need to consolidate its ideology and, and get the message out. You know, get, get people thinking that, oh, to be a globist is, is a good thing. Why? Blah, 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 blah. All the various reasons and ideology. Get rid of the arms, uh, the arms trade. You know, let's clean up the environment. Uh, get rid of poverty. We'll have to tax globally. Raw materials policy, like, should the oil under the Arab soil, should that belong to the Arabs or to everybody? <laughs> Highly controversial. Educate everybody. Uh, so... Eventually, just get rid of passports, right? Eventually, you're just free to go wherever you like, the way you are within a country, because that's the political unit today. But in, in, in a global state, you, anyone can go anywhere, okay? And then a shift in emphasis away from economics, once people get richer and richer, to global happiness. So invest a lot of money in research into what is happiness? What is compatibility? Friends, spouses, whatever, okay? And... Uh, well, when, when, when nanotechnology comes, everything changes. So, minutes. Okay, so how, how to actually get there? Well, he was one of the founders of the European Union, and his strategy was so merge the economies of former bitter rivals like France and Germany. When they had three major wars within a century. Franco-Prussian War, 1870, World War I, World War II. So, uh, you know, link the economies... Uh, people t today are talking about um, creating a community of d democratic nations within the, the UN. And NATO and o o OECD, they exist already. So you could use those perhaps as a platform to uh, use as a first step to, to, to Globa. <laughs> okay, that's, that's my second book. If, you're in, if you want details, go here. Go to um, Amazon. Just, uh, well, you can probably just search my name, Google it. Okay, now... <laughs> Can we have the, the, vid the, the video, please? Five minutes? <coughs> Four minutes? You ready to roll?
hypothesize that at some point computers will get so fast or will be able to simulate something on a par with human intelligence. At that point, they will not stop getting more intelligent. Do I think that it's only a question of time before human beings build conscious machines? Uh, I would say the answer is yes. By 2045, according to my calculations, we will multiply the intelligence of our human machine civilization a billion fold. This is going to lead to greater than human intelligence in a machine. That's such a profound change that we borrow this metaphor from physics and call it a singularity. Computers have been around for 60 years, and in that time, they've almost caught up with 200,000 years of human brain evolution. Pretty soon, they could be smarter than us. Ray Kurzweil thinks this will happen in our lifetimes, around 2045. Well, I'm Ray Kurzweil. I'm a inventor, futurist, and author. The first concept that's important to understand is the exponential growth of information technology. This computer is a billion times more powerful per dollar than the computer I use as a student. It's 100,000 times smaller. We'll do that again in the next 25 years. Uh, this will be the size of a blood cell. It will again be a billion times more powerful per dollar. Uh, than it is today. The design of the human brain is not simple, but it's not infinitely complex either. And it's a level of complexity we can master. And in fact, we're making exponential gains on understanding it. This decade, the, the 2010s, will be the, the decade of massive research on artificial brains. The physics of computation is such that, that future technologies can totally, utterly outperform, outclass what the human brain can do. For those who believe in the singularity, this isn't the distant future, it's already happening. In 1997, world chess champion Garry Kasparov was beaten by Deep Blue, a computer from IBM. And earlier this year, a machine called Watson competed against two human champions in the legendary game show Jeopardy and won. That was a wake-up call for a lot, of, a lot of Americans. When a computer beat the world champions, it, it, it really shook people. But as artificial intelligence becomes less artificial, as machines get smarter, what will this mean for the human race? Who or what should be dominant species? Should it, should it remain human beings? So I see a lot of people will, will absolutely reject the idea that humans should become number two. I don't think it's going to be an us-them phenomena with, uh, OK, humans on the left side of the room, computers on the right, and. Uh, let's get along with each other. It's going to be all mixed up. We're all going to be enhanced by these technologies as we already are. I think we are already information. And right now we have no way of capturing that and backing it up. We, th we think that's really weird, but we think nothing of backing up the information on, on, on this device. In fact, you feel pretty uncomfortable to not back it up. Yeah, we walk around without backing up our mind file. For some, the idea of machine intelligence merging with humanity could solve all our problems. We will make ourselves smarter by putting billions of these, which will be the size of blood cells, in our bodies. They'll keep us healthy from inside. They will go inside our brains, interact with our biological neurons, put our brains on the internet, on the cloud of computing. It's still not a guarantee of immortality, but it's a, it's a tipping point. Others in the movement think it could bring on a calamity greater than we've ever imagined. A war between man and cyborg, man and machine, or perhaps even cyborg and machine. Obviously, humanity, traditional humanity, you know, humanness will get lost. That prospect is going to threaten a large number of people. I might seem a cheery, happy sort of, optimistic sort of guy by personality, but, uh, what I'm predicting will happen is, in fact, the very opposite. I'm predicting a major war in the second half of this century over this issue of species dominance. We're talking about the survival, not of a country, we're talking about the survival of the species. If there's a major war, an intellect war, your kids will die. Immortality, cyborgs, the end of our species. If your brain is struggling to take it all in, don't worry. You just haven't upgraded yet. And though it might sound like science fiction, it's starting to be taken very seriously. This year, The Singularity has made the cover of Time magazine and a feature documentary has been released in the US. You have uh, people like Larry Page, CEO of Google, taking an interest in this stuff. Um, you know, you're starting to have prominent 
public figures willing to associate their names with the singularity. It's definitely moved, you know, from the fringes, if not into the mainstream, um, you know, and a lot closer. Still, many refuse to accept the central principle of the singularity, that a machine could ever replicate something so innately human as actual consciousness. They may be right. Either way, it won't be a long wait to find out. Okay, I have five minutes. Um, I believe, and a growing number of people, thousands of mainly techies at the moment, believe that uh, this century's global politics will be dominated by this issue. Should, here's the essential question that, that, that I believe uh, you know, we, we, we will all know about this increasingly as, our machi as, as the gap. Like, if this is human intelligence level, and this is machine intelligence level, in the 2010s is the decade of research. Uh, I'm a former brain builder. I, I was building China's first artificial brain before I retired. And there are projects like this popping up like mushrooms all over the planet. So in the 2020s, this research will have moved over to D, you know, R&D. So research will move more into development. And in the 2020s, you'll see new Googles and Microsofts where the product is artificial brains controlling all kinds of things, but household robots, huge industry, trillions of dollars a year. And then you will upgrade your home robot every year or two. And of course, with each upgrade, its intelligence, its artificial intelligence will keep increasing. So the gap between machine intelligence level and human intelligence level, that gap will close right? in the 2020s, 2030s, that, that time frame. And you can expect as that gap closes, the, the, this major question, should, should humanity build artelects, that's like artificial intellect or artificial minds, uh, in the next few decades? So it, this is not something that's a distant 22nd century vague science fiction maybe. This is the take home message I'm trying to drive home, right? This is something that's going to happen in the next few decades because, because of the accelerating rate of uh, progress in, in technologies. So, okay, three minutes. So I see as the debate, you know, the species dominance debate, as that heats up, as the gap closes, I see society splitting into three major ideological groups. The, the pro artelect uh, label them cosmists, based on the word cosmos. That's their perspective. Second group, opposed. Their, their primary motive will be fear. They'll be, they will be afraid that these artelects, once they become like a trillion, trillion times above our human mental capacities, once they reach that level, they may look on us as so inferior that they treat us as pests. Right? So the second group, label them Terrans, Terra, the Earth, so that's their perspective. So Cosmos, Terrans, and there's a third group. They want to do this. They want to become artelects themselves by doing this. They convert themselves from human to artelect by, by upgrading. Okay? Now, uh, I see a major war coming over species dominance. I mean, th think about it. Do, do you really believe everybody is going to accept the idea of becoming the number two species? And, and that's why I'm asking you to fill in the questionnaire, please. Because if a reasonable percentage of you think this is not going to happen, well, then what happens? And I'm, I'm predicting a war, a war, a terrible war, an extermination war between those who want to build these godlike machines and the other group saying, no, human beings should remain dominant. And then the whole situation gets complicated by, by these guys, the so-called cyborgs, cybernetic organism, part machine, part human. Right? So some people within the movement, the, the species dominance movement or the singularity movement, some people say, oh no, all human beings will do this. And therefore, there won't be any cosmists and Terrans to have a war. You'll just go around the problem. We'll, di we'll divert the problem. So, uh, you know, think about it. You've got the questionnaire, hopefully one per person. Please fill them in over lunch and bring them back to me at the beginning of the next, the first session in the afternoon. And then I'll analyze them. 
perhaps give you the results tomorrow morning. And then those results will go out in a mass media campaign to a dozen countries. But it, it's only this year the whole issue is, is becoming mainstream. And I have 13 seconds left, so it's probably a good, good time to stop. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.